now it's time for RTB 101, where we discuss practical questions to equip you to share your faith more effectively. And here to help me talk about RTB's flood model is astrophysicist Dr. Hugh Ross. Welcome back, Hugh. Hello. Always glad to have you here. Now, Hugh, we take the position at Reasons to Believe that the first 11 chapters of Genesis are, in fact, history. They reflect real events. Real events. So we want to get that down right away. Now, our friends who are young earth creationists would say with the Noah story that's within those first 11 chapters of Genesis, they would say that that story describes a global flood event, that of water that covered the whole planet. We take a little different position. So talk us through kind of the key features of, of our flood model. Well, like with any biblical issue, you want to look at the entire Bible. A lot of people think Genesis 6, 7, and 8 are the only places that the Bible addresses Noah's flood. Second Peter addresses it. The poetic books address it. So you really want to look at everything the Bible's got to say about the flood of Noah. And when you go to the New Testament, for example, 2 Peter 2, 5 says the world of ungodly people was flooded, mm -hmm. which is basically defining the world. I mean, and also you notice in 2 Peter 3, 5, and 6, Peter says the world at the time that it existed. So in both cases, the Greek word cosmos is qualified with an adjective, meaning that we're to look at less than the entire globe. It's the world of ungodly people was flooded. And from what we see in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, by the time of Noah, human beings had yet to build cities in Antarctica and Greenland. And uh, therefore, there would be no need for God to flood Antarctica and Greenland. But I think the most explicit texts are those we see in uh, Job, Psalms, and Proverbs. Psalm 104, the longest of the creation psalms, when it addresses creation day three, that's verses five, six, seven, and eight, talks about God transforming our planet from a water world where there's no continents or islands, just water in the surface of the earth, uh, to a world where you've got continents, islands, and oceans. And verse 9 says, never again will water cover the whole face of the earth. So there's an explicit statement. Once we've got continents on the face of the earth, never again are we going to return to a water world. Now that would allow the world of ungodly people to be flooded, but not the entire planet to be flooded. And I find it compelling too, in three other Psalms, and in Job 38 and Proverbs 8, it likewise speaks about God creating permanent barriers to the waters once the continents are in place. So multiple places and we have this declaration that although it was the whole world of ungodly people, including all the animals, soulish animals that were associated with them, it wasn't the entire planet. So let me try to summarize a couple of key points that you made there. One is that the flood did not cover the entire planet. It was geographically local. A second point that you made is that it wiped out all of humanity. Except for those on board the ark. Except for those on the ark. Very good. And the third point you made is that these other passages, Psalm 104, Proverbs 8, Job 38, those describe the initial creation days that are described back in Genesis chapter 1. Right. That has nothing to do with Noah's flood. Those are not descriptions of Noah's flood. They're not descriptions of Noah's flood, but they are descriptions, detailed descriptions of creation day 3 with the added statement that once the continents are in place, the water will never again cover the whole face of the earth, okay. which rules up the possibility that Noah's flood could be global in extent. And as I talk to my young earth friends, they frequently cite uh, Genesis 7, 11, and following, uh, where it talks about all the mountains being covered with water to a depth of 15 cubits. Well, that was going to be my next question, okay, is what do you do it. with the kind of some of this other biblical data that seems to say that all the high mountains on the planet were covered? Right. Well, again, we make the point that in biblical Hebrew, you got uh, only a small vocabulary. So the word translated mountains uh, is equivalent to the word for hills or mounds. And the word high there could also mean elevated. So like all the elevated hills that are visible to Noah from a position on top of the ark. 
And I think the clincher is what you see in Genesis 8, 5, and 9. And this is the part where the flood waters are receding. And uh, Noah releases a dove. And in verse 5, Noah's looking out from the top of the ark and he can see the distant hills. He releases the dove. In verse 9, it tells us from the dove's perspective, water covered the whole face of the earth. The same phrase you see in Genesis 7.19. So it tells us that just because Genesis 7.19 says all the high or elevated hills and mountains were covered by 15 cubits of water, doesn't mean we're talking about all the mountains on the entire face of the earth. Rather, it's all the mountains from the viewpoint of Noah, just like all the hills and mountains from the viewpoint of the dove. So the phrase over the entire face of the earth needs to be understood in the context of the observer. Another helpful point for me when I was studying this is to understand that the word that's translated in English for the whole earth just can also mean the whole land. Right. It doesn't have to encompass the entire planet. Also, you see in Genesis 8 the use of the word karabah in Hebrew, and that's a word that can never be used to refer to the entire surface of the earth. Okay. So when we're talking to non-Christians and the topic of Noah's flood comes up, what have you experienced that this taking this strategy or this approach is helpful with them? Well, many non-Christians think that the Bible teaches that the flood of Noah must be global. And for them to discover that the Bible doesn't teach that, that rather teaches a flood that encompasses all of humanity and their soulish animals and not necessarily the whole planet, now they're willing to take the Bible as a serious, inerrant document. So it... It begins to, to remove an obstacle. It does. Very good. Well, thanks, Hugh, for helping us kind of think this part of our creation model through. It's an important thing that comes up a lot when we're sharing our faith. And I do want to encourage you, if you haven't yet, check out Hugh's blog. Just go to our website, reasons.org, and search for Today's New Reason to Believe.